Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We are aware that today is a busy morning for news in the house, but we are delighted to welcome once again to the press briefing room, Madam President, the President of the General Assembly, Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinosa. Your Excellency, without further ado, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. It's always a pleasure and a delight to be with you. Um, we cross in the corridors all the time. I see you running around uh, trying to do your job. I always say hi, hello, and but we, uh, you know, we don't have the time to just sit down face to face, interact, and, and have a conversation. So I'm always available. As you know, we have bilateral interviews with many, many of you more than once. But uh, uh, here I am. My intention is not to provide you with a, a report back, because uh, Monica does that in a very professional and thorough way every day when she interacts with you. Uh, but uh, I think that I wanted to be here with you in this uh, press briefing room to see you all uh, face to face. In, in fact, uh, I think I have asked my team that I should meet you. And uh, we have tried to arrange this conference for a while now. Uh, and as you, we know, we have had a very, very tough and packed agenda. So I'm happily um, that we finally found this moment uh, to have this exchange. Also, uh, I know because I also follow you, you have been very productive uh, yourselves, doing a lot. Uh, just saw your new uh, Anka guide. Thank you for that. Thank you for the lovely gift and uh, for the reception that you held despite uh, the pouring rain, I was told. And uh, if you allow me, uh, I would like uh, publicly once again say um, happy birthday, Evelyn. And I'm sorry that I couldn't join the party, but happy, happy birthday. Uh, you were in my thoughts. Uh, I wasn't around, but uh, happy birthday. And um, uh, I, I heard the party was worthwhile, was a, a good one. And so um, I know that your actual birthday, it's on the 1st of August. So we still have many more opportunities to repeat uh, parties for, for, for Evelyn. So, well, anyhow, um, we are um, at the end of June, uh, approaching the start uh, of a new month in a few days. And there is still, I have to tell you, substantial uh, work to be done for the presidency and the, for the high level week, which as you know, uh, it is prepared uh, by my office and, and my presidency. It is going to be extremely challenging. It is the first time ever when uh, we will have five summits in five days in high level week. Uh, I would like to draw your attention of also to some of the events in the coming months uh, before high level week. On the 18th of July, we will celebrate Nelson Mandela International Day among other events. And about a month later, on the 12th of August, we will organize a youth dialogue on the International Day of Youth. So just so you can put them on your calendars, 18 July, Nelson Mandela, 12th of August, uh, youth uh, Dialogue for International Youth Day. It is very clear that young people are, in many ways, uh, and I can say that firsthand, driving the agenda, and we need to include each and every one of them in the debate uh, we lead on global challenges, which I have done during my tenure. There has been no one high-level event, even at presidential level, where uh, we haven't had uh, meaningful engagement and participation of uh, young leaders uh, from all over the world. Uh, an example that stands out is uh, the high-level event on climate, which has had a very particular focus on intergenerational responsibilities on climate change. And we had 80 uh, young people from every region interacting with heads of state and government and with uh, uh, ministers on the future of the climate agenda. In August 22nd, uh, we will mark the first international day uh, commemorating the victims of acts uh, of violence based on religion or belief. This is a new resolution that was approved by uh, the General Assembly. So the first 
time that we will uh, commemorate uh, the day of victims of acts of violence based on, rel on religion or belief would be is going to be on the 22nd of August. So for the ones who are uh, planning to go out for summer holidays, just make sure that at least colleagues of yours, but uh, you cover you cover that. I think it's going to be extremely meaningful because uh, we have had so much pain and losses this year uh, regarding violence um, based on religion or belief. Uh, on the 9th of September, General Assembly will hold a high-level plenary meeting to commemorate and promote International Day against nuclear tests. The nuclear issue is something that should concern us all, especially uh, due to the latest developments. Uh, I think that, uh, so to keep that in mind, 9 September and a few days before my successor, the president-elect, um, uh, His Excellency Tijani Mohamed Bande, takes over, we will have a high-level forum to observe the 20th anniversary of the culture of peace. Uh, this will take place on the 13th of September. We are dedicating a great deal of effort to these events as we did with others. We want quality, we want content, we want impact. We are also seeing more and more a uh, new way of convening these meetings, which is more interactive and more action-oriented. Uh, one of the changes we managed to introduce is to make the UN closer to the people and the people closer to the UN. Every single high-level event has had uh, participation of private sector, participation of women's groups, civil society, activists. Uh, we have really steered up the conversation. We have broken the molds even on formats uh, using um, a Davos-style uh, um, arrangement in the General Assembly Hall, uh, making sure that the blue seats uh, are used not only for super high level uh, participants, but uh, for example, uh, when we uh, celebrated the launch of the International Year of Indigenous Languages, it was occupied by indigenous leaders themselves. Uh, so we have tried to uh, you know, be innovative on the formats, on the kind of conversation, on the impact of um, the, the, the dialogues uh, we are undertaking. Uh, and, and I see and I can say with, with great satisfaction that we have steered up, uh, you know, the, the, sometimes it's difficult uh, because people like to do things. They always uh, it, uh, practice and custom uh, is uh, bread and butter of this organization. But I have tried to steer it up. Even yesterday, I don't know if some of you um, either attended or, or followed uh, the ceremony of the signing of the UN Charter in the General Assembly Hall. For the first time, we brought all the flags inside. We did this symbolic uh, signing ceremony. This, um, as a woman, I can tell you, I mean, they can say, well, why to sign the, the charter again and the flags and all that, but it has a very strong uh, symbolic uh, power. Uh, it means that we need to recommit to the very principles of the foundation of our organization. So you will recall that two days ago, uh, uh, for example, we invited two students from Gaza, another from the West Bank, uh, to speak at the meeting on voluntary contributions to UNRWA. I think that was also very, uh, very powerful. Um, um, I think that it is a fact that citizens of the world, uh, the we the peoples, uh, are taking a more active part in addressing global challenges all and uh, reinforces, uh, you know, uh, multilateralism uh, in action. And uh, uh, yesterday, I have to say, it was also an important moment because we were able to launch uh, the process to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Um, I think that next year is going to be very interesting because there are a lot of preparations for the 75th anniversary. That was an initiative that I pushed very hard myself. Uh, we were able to pass a resolution on the modalities for the 75th anniversary. 
the uh, Secretary General has uh, joined uh, forces and just provided also a very special place to the commemoration of the 75th anniversary from the side of the Secretariat, uh, from, uh, you know, our um, executive arm, but also we need a lot of political traction for the 75th anniversary. We need high-level conversation on the future of multilateralism, and this has to rely you know, in the hands and commitment of member states themselves. That's why we passed the resolution. That's why uh, we are also preparing at the highest political level to come to September 2020 with a very strong, renewed, refreshed narrative on multilateralism. Um, another w issue that I wanted to, to, to comment uh, is uh, our global campaign against plastic pollution and single-use plastics. Uh, I think it's been extremely successful, modesty apart, but it has been extremely successful. Our concert in Antigua and Barbuda uh, was uh, followed and enjoyed the engagement of millions, hundreds of millions of people around the world. Uh, our um, efforts uh, to phase out single-use plastics in-house at the UN has also been extremely successful. Uh, I have to be very honest with you, at the beginning I thought that it was a battle that perhaps I wasn't going to be able to win in one year, and we did it. Uh, we did it because of the uh, high quality of my team, because of my own determination to do it, and because of the great support of the Secretary General himself. So uh, I am very proud to say that uh, starting in June, we are a single-use plastic-free um, uh, venue, and we have to multiply that same effort in all UN offices worldwide, and that's the next um, the next step. And, and I'm sure that my successor is going to continue uh, with uh, with the campaign. Uh, he was present when we uh, um, uh, opened the exhibit with National Geographic. I, ha I hope that you have all seen the exhibit of National Geographic. Uh, I, I think it's very telling, very powerful as a message. Um, and, uh, and he committed himself to continue the single-use plastic uh, ban campaign. We also continue to work on high-level events uh, for a high-level week. Uh, as mentioned, five summit-level meetings in five days, universal health coverage, climate action summit uh, organized by uh, the Secretary General, the first ever SDG uh, summit, the financing for development high-level dialogue, and the Samoa Pathway midterm uh, review. So it is a lot. We are preparing not only the formats, the modalities, but we're also preparing the political outcomes, uh, the political declarations that are is work in progress. And uh, I, I am very optimistic because uh, there is a lot of engagement from member states, uh, a lot of uh, commitment uh, to, to have, uh, you know, meaningful head of state and government uh, level uh, uh, agreements on this, uh, uh, on these issues. Um, I think that uh, my team and I are, are prepared uh, to work until, until the very, very last day with a very busy agenda. I have to, to be very honest with you. I have a very busy agenda. If you combine the negotiation processes for high-level week, the ongoing negotiation processes that go beyond that, uh, but also um, the uh, uh, um, events that are still uh, pending during this process, plus the regular uh, handover, the reports. You know that I provide, every three months, I have provided a thorough report to all member states on my own activities, besides the website, be besides uh, all of that. So we are preparing for that. Uh, I won't take uh, more of your time, and I will be uh, more than happy uh, to respond to your questions uh, now. Thank you, Madam President, for your opening remarks. The first question goes to Anka Valeria Robeco, and afterwards we have Joel, and I'll have your hands. Okay, thank you. Okay, you are. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, for this press briefing. Um, and uh, my question is uh, if you have uh, any comment uh, on the picture of the father and daughters migrants that uh, uh, in the Rio Grande close to US Mexican border. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Can we, you want me to respond yeah, one on one? one? This one, and then we have Joe afterwards. Yes. Okay. You know, to be very honest with you, when, when I saw that, um, you know, I was almost in tears because, uh, you know, this cannot be happening. Uh, you know, we cannot have more people die because they decide to migrate to another country. And uh, that's precisely why uh, member states came together and crafted the Global Compact on Migration. That is precisely why we have a very strong international framework on human rights. It so happens that people on the move are human beings, and as such, they are entitled to have uh, their fundamental rights respected. Um, I think that um, all this, these tragedies, these really painful tragedies, uh, call and cry for a very strong also uh, responses. And uh, what we see is that uh, um, Mexico and the Northern Triangle are uh, really uh, responding. And this is going to be uh, good for uh, Oscar Alberto Martinez uh, and his daughter, Valeria, uh, it's for them, and um, I, I've been uh, I've been really following uh, closely the development and and the crafting of the the Mexico Comprehensive Development Plan together uh, with the political will and participation of the countries of the Northern Triangle, uh, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, and basically this plan is precisely to put in action the Global Compact on Migration, to uh, really take a preventive approach and to look at the structural causes of migration and tackle the structural causes of migration. And we all know what they are. Inequality, poverty, lack of opportunities uh, for young families. And the other big lesson of, of, of the terrible, uh, terrible disaster uh, yesterday is that um, the big lesson is that we need to fight uh, human trafficking, which is a major crime. And sometimes we tend to forget and, and downplay what um, human trafficking does. Uh, it creates, uh, you know, numbers vary, but, you know, more than $4 billion every year. Uh, the criminals that, uh, you know, head and, and nurture these illegal networks of, of human trafficking. So we need to be bold and strong uh, to fight and combat uh, human trafficking as well. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I go to Joe and then I have a follow-up with Ahmed. I have everybody. Okay, Evelyn yeah. as well. Uh, okay. Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. This is a follow-up to the uh, informal meeting on anti-Semitism, which was very moving uh -huh. yesterday, and I know you had a very big hand in organizing, uh, which is much appreciated. The follow-up is, uh, what do you say to those, and there are quite a number of critics, who uh, criticize the UN itself uh, for unfairly and disproportionately targeting the Jewish state of Israel in a whole number of one-sided resolutions, General Assembly, Human Rights uh, Council, for example. And I want to point out something very specifically that maybe you could comment on. I've asked this before. Uh, but um, I believe it was last November. Uh, there were a whole series of anti-Israel uh, General Assembly resolutions that were passed. Some with less than two-thirds vote. And yet uh, the uh, resolution condemning Hamas, the terrorist organization Hamas, um, you had ruled required a two-thirds vote, and it did not pass. And again, some see this as a discriminatory treatment. Uh, so could you comment on that? Thank you. Sure. I, I think that um, I agree with you. The, the, the event on anti-Semitism was very moving, but I think uh, beyond moving, it was also a wake-up call for all of us. Um, for the international community as a whole. And, and I think that um, the principles uh, of our organization, and, and, and yesterday I think it was a very powerful message to re-sign the We the Peoples, the charter on the 26th of June. Precisely because of that, this organization is about 
zero tolerance to any form of violence, discrimination based on, on race, on, on, regi uh, on uh, uh, religious uh, belief, uh, on sexual orientation. It means zero tolerance to any form of violence and discrimination. And um, painfully, we have to acknowledge that uh, anti-Semitism has grown and that unfortunately also, and I know that perhaps uh, you can help us think through this because to be very honest, I have mixed feelings there. The role of social media, uh, you know, in spreading hate, spe uh, hate speech, uh, in spreading, you know, anti-Semitism. Uh, how can we control that? How can we make sure that uh, our education systems uh, take care th uh, of, 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 of this issue in a more comprehensive and broader way? It is not a matter of, of uh, you know, having one class uh, in, in class history uh, giving a couple of examples of, uh, and telling us about the Holocaust. When we have more than 100 websites that are designed with one purpose, which is to deny the very existence of the Holocaust. And that is, it, these are, it's hard data. Hmm? It's a, a research from the Tel Aviv University. So I think that we do have a collective responsibility there. I commend the initiative of the Secretary General and his system-wide uh, initiative to combat hate speech. Um, I also commend uh, the Alliance on Civilizations and uh, uh, Miguel Angel Moratinos, who is doing uh, you know, a great uh, job putting together a strategy to protect um, places of worship. Uh, and regarding your overall question about a particular country being treated unfairly, I think that uh, the General Assembly is a parliament and the, the parliament has to express the will of the majority and that we have a long history of resolutions uh, that uh, tackle the issue of the Middle East. And in there, I think that as president of the parliament, uh, I have to abide by uh, the will of, uh, of the General Assembly itself. Um, in a, I, I cannot have uh, judgment uh, on that. It is the expression of the most democratic body of this organization. But just, so, just as a very quick follow-up, mm -hmm. uh, going back to that specific vote on Hamas, you did have the discretion to determine whether a two-thirds vote was required, uh, you know, which is a political question. And there were other resolutions in, in, uh, in that day and the day and week before dealing with the Middle East, dealing with Israel, anti-Israel, at least two of which did not require a two-thirds vote. So I'm just wondering why, in this case, uh, you, went, you decided to set the bar higher at two-thirds, which was not met. The majority would have passed that resolution against Hamas. Well, I have to say, perhaps to recall, that um, my ruling in that, uh, that day was, my ruling was precisely to ask member states whether they thought that we needed a two-thirds majority for that resolution. And it was the will of the majority of the member states. I followed strictly and by the book the procedures of the General Assembly. So I asked them and they responded uh, to me. And I've been extremely careful on respecting uh, the procedures uh, and, the, uh, and the, the rules of procedure of the General Assembly and on listening uh, to the voice uh, of the member states. That's my role as president. So my ruling was to ask them. Thank you, Madam President. I feel like at school here because I'm putting your names down as you put your hands up. So now I have, in this order, I have Mario and then Georg. Carla, go ahead, Mario. Yes, yes, yes. Let, let Mario go and then I, I'm going to get back to you. Okay, Mario, go ahead, please. Mario Yarko, la agencia F. Gracias, Presidenta. Just to follow up on the migration issue, uh, you mentioned the compact for migration. Have you seen really any progress? And if you can comment on the situation of uh, children separated from their families uh, in the southern border of the US. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, indeed. After the adoption uh, uh, and the endorsement by the General Assembly of the Compact in December, we've been working on uh, making sure that uh, we uh, establish uh, a follow-up and compliance framework. Um, and we established the International um, Migration Review Forum. This is an ongoing process. Uh, it's part of a negotiation which is being uh, co-facilitated by um, Spain and Bangladesh. Uh, it is work in progress, uh, that on the implementation of the Global Compact. We have seen very concrete uh, outcomes where the compact has been um, used uh, directly from its text. The 23 policy recommendations of the migration compact have been uh, implemented on the ground. This is the perfect case of the comprehensive plan of Mexico and the countries of the Northern Triangle. The UN has had a very instrumental role there, especially ECLAC, our Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, regarding the particular uh, situation of minors being separated of their parents. Uh, and I think that we, here we're not only dealing with uh, uh, migration frameworks, uh, we are dealing about human rights. And uh, yet again, I repeat that. People on the move are human beings, so they are entitled uh, to be uh, you know, guaranteed uh, their fundamental rights. And the, the m most powerful instrument we have in hand is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So this uh, should not be happening. Thank you. Georg. Uh, Georg Tichy, thank you. Ukrainian news agency, Ukraine Forum. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, my question is regarding Ukrainian resolutions. There were, in the last half a year, two important resolutions. Uh, on Crimea, militarization of Crimea mm -hmm. and uh, human rights violations in Crimea. And both of them were not, um, they were just ignored, uh, basically. And um, as you said, this is the parliament, this is the most democratic body which, which adopts yeah. uh, decisions by the will of majority. And it's, of course, not only Russia that ignores resolutions, there are some other countries which do that. I just wonder your opinion on when countries ignore resolutions, how does it affect the general credibility and authority of the institution? Well, I've, I've always said that we really need uh, to be serious on the uh, implementation deficit that we have regarding our own resolutions. And this is true for most of the resolutions we adopt uh, in the General Assembly. Um, this year, I think we are uh, getting closer to 300, am I right, Inga? You keep the, the numbers, uh, you know, every day. But we're very close to 300. Perhaps we will go a little above 300 this year. And um, basically, uh, we have a process, and, and I have a lot of faith in this process, which is the revitalization of the General Assembly. And one of the issues that we are really discussing seriously is about uh, how to uh, streamline uh, the work that the committees and the specialized committees, but the general um, membership uh, does uh, regarding, is you know the crafting of the resolutions, the passing of the resolutions, but also the implementation of the resolutions, and this is not only. Uh, regarding, uh, you know, Ukraine and the already existing resolutions. There are so many more, but not only from the General Assembly, from the Security Council also. So I think that we, we really need to come to grips. And even in, when we are crafting the resolution, making sure that some um, uh, verification and review of compliance is embedded in the text uh, of the resolution. Sometimes, you know, most resolutions, they call for, for example, report of the Secretary General, high-level events, no? 
that's how it goes, but uh, they should include some kind of review and compliance. But this is a, a, a work that needs to be addressed and, and, and done by the entire membership and, and be brought to the revitalization exercise, uh, which, uh, you know, looks mild and minor, but is one of the most profound and important processes. And that's why I have devoted a lot of time and energy to make sure that we have a strong resolution on revitalization this year. Okay, we have Shana, Kyo um, Ahmed and Carla. I've got you, I've, you're on my list. Shana, go ahead, please, Hi. thank you. Thank you for having this briefing. Just a quick question on the issue of Security Council reform. We understand there was a rollover, ha um, as has been the tradition for many years, and the IGN sort of goes on and on and on. But how would you describe the advances that were made under your presidency and very realistically speaking, how do you see UN Security Council reform playing out in the future? And what lessons learned would you pass on to the new PGA? I, I'm sorry, it's a little early to talk about it, but I'd appreciate your answer. Thank you. Sure. I, I think you're right in saying, and I agree with you, I've been saying this uh, since, the very, since the very beginning, that um, Security Council reform is one of the most contentious and divisive issues that we have, uh, you know, uh, in the General Assembly. Um, I have to also acknowledge that uh, the uh, uh, progress and the IGN work uh, this year was extremely difficult, uh, contentious, um, complicated because uh, there are different groups, there are different views, there are different interests. Within the groups, you, you also can see that there are differences. And, you know, the task uh, of uh, the a president of the General Assembly is to make sure that you bring all of them together in their differences, in their differences, and try to find a common denominator. And in doing that, to ensure that this process is inclusive, it's transparent, uh, uh, and, uh, and it brings forward uh, the mandate of, of, the, of Security Council reform. Um, this is one of the issues since um, the very first day I said, this is very much a member state driven process. So I have performed my role as to be uh, uh, a bridge, to be a convener, uh, to be uh, you know, a consensus builder uh, among very different positions. I have to tell you that it was not easy. Lots of hours of my chef de cabinet, of our expert team, of myself, uh, meeting with every single group, subgroup. And at the end of the day, uh, I think that I'm very satisfied with the, with the outcome. Uh, because, uh, in, and perhaps now that it's over, because uh, we decided on the rollover decision, I can say that um, this has to be an incremental process, and this has to enjoy you know, the, uh, the widest possible um, agreement among member states. So what we were able to do, in my opinion, is to streamline uh, the process, rolling over only two documents, the framework document and this year's um, document. Even if, you know, several countries were unhappy, but in multilateralism, if you have everybody equally unhappy, is that you have succeeded. No, and also, you know, the continuation of the IGN, of the dynamics of, of the IGN. I think, um, you know, I said this with humility, but it's, it, it's a pretty good uh, material for the incoming president to take over uh, the process uh, next year. We're going to move on to um, Ahmad, Carla, and Errol. Um, yeah, I have to say that we are live on UN Web TV, but also on the PJ's uh, Twitter account, UN underscore PJ. So let's go ahead. Thank you, Madam Ahmad. President, for this briefing. Ahmed Fati, uh, American Television News. Uh, with regard to the migration, and you spoke about the, the clear relationship between uh, migration and human trafficking in many parts of the world. Uh, last, over the weekend, 
Vice President, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence said that uh, uh, the, they pay uh, in the range of $5,000 for uh, traffickers to be smuggled uh, into the United States. At any point, why is the international community uh, just focusing on uh, extremely wide-angle uh, picture so many resol resolutions, compact, which is the average uh, citizen on the ground uh, in the villages and the valleys, they do not really relate to. Is there any way to create uh, like a cooperative fund for these people that they can put the $5,000 matched by other donors to increase $5,000? This will give them a sort of a microfinance to start a small business or improve their, uh, their living instead of taking uh, gambling with their life across uh, borders and, and seas. Thank you. OK. I think that's a very good question because it is precisely the comprehensive plan of the countries of the Northern Triangle. It's precisely what it is uh, uh, you know, looking at how to prevent people to leave their home countries for different reasons. And for that, you need to understand what are the, uh, the underlying causes of migration. And uh, they're not easy to address or solve, because here you're dealing with high levels of inequality, with poverty, with lack of jobs, lack of access to quality education. So it is an overall comprehensive um, strategy. And at the end of the day, if you ask me uh, if we succeed to implement the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda, it would be the, the, the biggest service uh, and the biggest preventive strategy uh, to, uh, to dangerous and unsafe migration. Because what, what the Compact does precisely is establish a framework for, for orderly, uh, uh, safe, and regular migration. And, and so in implementing the compact, that I, I think that we will be doing a great uh, service to combat uh, human trafficking as well. Thank you. My friends, ha let's help one another and have concise questions so we have everybody. Because now I see more hands. I've got you, Ibis. Carla, go ahead. Carla, Arrow, and Evelyn. Go ahead, Carla. Thank you, Madam mm -hmm. President. Uh, Carla Stay from Global Research. One of your most important concerns that you've expressed earlier was concern about inequality. And can you comment upon Philip Alston's report, he's the rapporteur mm -hmm. on extreme poverty, about the fact that 20% of the British citizens, as a result of the austerity measures imposed, uh, are living below the poverty line. He said it's, these are conditions going back to what Dickens, Charles Dickens described 100 years ago. Also, on the 3rd of May, the Los Angeles Times described uh, incredibly poor homeless people living in tents in Los Angeles where the poverty is so extreme they throw excrement onto the street and officers who have entered trying to help these people have ended up contracting typhoid. So yeah. while the issue of migration is, is a tragic one, we have citizens within countries, the most uh, affluent countries on earth who are living horrifically, also, as a follow-up question, you did mention two events uh, in September, the event on culture of peace and the event on nuclear weapons. Mm. And I had earlier uh, suggested, I know one of the former presidents of the United States is passionate about the fact that he has stated the United States is the number one warmonger in the world. And he has stated he's for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Why not have President Jimmy Carter as a keynote speaker at one of these events? Thank you, Carla. Madam Thank President. you very much for, for your uh, questions, Carla. And, um, and uh, I will start by the end. Uh, invitation of President, former President Carter, of course. Uh, it's it's uh, a logistics issue, a coordination issue, and my office will be more than happy to follow up with you and make sure that it happens. I'll be delighted to have him here. Um, the second question is more profound, structural, and complicated. But uh, you know, just to to make the story short, um, inequality and poverty. Uh, you cannot draw a line. You cannot draw a clear map anymore of the north-south divide. And to say that 
all poverty is in the southern hemisphere and the wealth and the prosperity and the equality is up here. It doesn't happen that way anymore. Unfortunately, you know, issues of conflict, of climate change, of insecurity, you know, are spreading north, south, east, west. And you do have huge inequality gaps, north and south, east and west. So I think that uh, really coming to grips uh, with a new uh, international financial architecture, uh, with a, a new um, fresh uh, fiscal re redistribution system, uh, a new taxation system, including on climate change issues. Um, it's uh, uh, the, way, the way to go. I mean, uh, here there's no black and white ac answer. There's no straight answer. But we do need more multilateral action for that to happen. We need more 2030 agenda implementation uh, to tackle these issues. And the numbers are out there. Uh, you know, the level of inequality is not only on the financial gap and on the poverty. You need, uh, you, uh, you need dimensional poverty uh, regarding GDP. It's a multidimensional poverty. And uh, I would say that one of the most scary poverty is, is the, 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 the soul poverty also that we are seeing. Uh, people with uh, no hope, uh, with uh, no project, with no dreams for the future, uh, and uh, that are sick, but uh, not physically, but sometimes uh, deep inside them. And uh, I know that we've been webcasted, and this is really not, uh, you know, the very um, uh, Cartesian way to respond. But we need to also recover from our souls and our minds and our capacity to love humankind and the planet. Okay, two questions, and then we move. Errol, and I have Evelyn in my list. Thank and you very much. Sato and Mo Ibis. Thank you very much, Monica. Madam President, thank you, as you said, for the bilateral interview, which was very well received and for the time, for the, because of the time. I'm just moving to my actual question. According to uh, uh, American media, there is uh, pressuring from the uh, US delegation at the G20 summit mm -hmm. in Osaka to the host to water down their statement on climate change or climate pact, whatever. So I'm asking you, since this is one of your seven priorities, whether you would like to use, do you have a hope that you can do from this podium or your activity by the end of your presidency to have most prominent or even most prominent mm -hmm. organization? Because at the end of the day, we can only imagine what would happen if US would be on the board with these issues, so what would you say or do? And Evelyn, a question before Madam President answers too. Thank you. Right, on UNRWA, I heard your statement on UNRWA and the entire pledging conference the other day. Do you think UNRWA can raise enough money by the end of the year, not just to tide it over by the summer? Um, I didn't hear the Gulf states give any kind of a pledge. And on plastic pollution, do you have any success in other UN headquarters, Geneva, Nairobi, wherever? Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got you. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, first on climate G20, um, basically, uh, I think that, um, I mean, we do not have a choice. My message to the G20 leaders in general would be we don't have options we need to take seriously uh, transitions to uh, um, carbon neutral economies. Um, the European Union has committed to do so. Um, it was not unanimous, the commitment of the European Union, and we know, but uh, the majority, the, the vast majority of uh, EU member states uh, for uh, to meet their target of the carbon neutrality by 20, 2050. Um, we do not have time, we run out, out of time, and uh, um, the, uh, the cost of inaction is going to be, you know, unquantifiable because it is not only material loss, it's human lives, and uh, macroeconomic losses. If we care about money and prosperity, you know, the, the damages caused by... Uh, by um, 
impacts of climate change, uh, droughts and floods and destruction of infrastructure and incapacity of the affected countries to pay their debt, as simple as that, to be subjects of credit, uh, to implement the sustainable development goals. So I think that uh, my message would be is we have run out, out of time. We ha are in a climate emergency and the cost of inaction is too high. Okay, and now Evelyn's question on UNRWA, the oh, pledge. Oh, UNRWA, sorry, Evelyn. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, we had this uh, pledge um, 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 session the other day, uh, the day before yesterday. 120, uh, 110 million is not good enough. We need 50% more of that sum, and hopefully we will uh, close the gap uh, by the end of the summer, because otherwise, uh, you know, the, the, the price and the weight would be in the Palestinian children that cannot go to school, that cannot go have, you know, the basic he uh, health services um, um, provided. So I really hope that uh, we will uh, be able to close the gap on the UNRWA funding. Thank you. Satu and Ibis. Satu, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, hold up on the uh, climate change. So next month, uh, there is a meeting about high-level political forum, including climate change, and we are very focusing on. So how, uh, at, uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, at the rest of your term, uh, how, how do you uh, exercise your leadership for accelerating the, the climate action to the world? Thank you. Ibis? Uh, hi, Ibis Frade from France Latina News Agency. If you allow me, I'm going to ask in Spanish, but you can answer sure. in, in English. Uh, desde hace 27 <laughs> años, <laughs> la Asamblea General de la ONU eh, se ha pronunciado contra el bloqueo de Estados Unidos contra Cuba. Y también eh, lo han hecho numerosos países en el evento de alto nivel de la Asamblea General. Hace poco, Estados Unidos activó el título 3 de la ley Helm Burton y, y también ha implementado eh, nuevas medidas y sanciones contra Cuba, sobre todo en el tema de los viajes a Cuba. De hecho, el Peace Boat no pudo entrar a, a puertos cubanos. Cuba ha denunciado varias veces que el bloqueo es el principal obstáculo para su desarrollo. Usted estuvo hace poco en la isla. Si me puede comentar eh, al respecto, ¿cuál es su consideración sobre este tema del bloqueo de Estados Unidos contra Cuba? Gracias. Thank you. So we start with status question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, perhaps I will, I will respond in Spanish to Prensa Latina's question, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, okay, the question on the climate summit. Um, I think that the climate summit is going to be um, a proof, a test to the capacity of the multilateral system to deliver. Uh, the, the, the summit is being very well prepared. Uh, I contributed as president of the General Assembly organizing a high-level uh, meeting on climate in March to prepare for the summit um, with the presence of heads of state and government, uh, with uh, several ministers. And, uh, and basically, uh, the idea, um, the innovation of, of the summit is that it brings together these nine coalitions on the nine critical issues uh, on the climate agenda it, that brings together the private sector, civil society, and governments uh, to join forces on uh, issues as critical as climate finance, uh, technology transfer and capacity building, the role of cities in, in climate change. Um, I have to have a very good memory to remember the five, but it's five coalitions. Um, the funding coalition, for example, is being led by by Qatar, by France, and um, a third country here. But it, it's it's out there. I mean, it's very very easy. But I think that's the innovation part. Uh, everybody together, and um, as the Secretary General has very clearly stated, for the summit, we do not expect um, our leaders to come uh, with speeches, but with plans and with concrete commitments. So we have high expectations uh, for the summit, uh, but not only for the summit, but after uh, after the summit. Uh, I really also hope that uh, the next, next COP 
uh, which is happening in Latin America and Chile concretely, is going to be you know a big step forward in the implementation of the uh, uh, Paris Agreement rulebook that we adopted in Katowice uh, this year. So there are the challenges are there. Uh, greater political ambition is needed, and we hope that we will have good news after the G20. Uh, on uh, la pregunta sobre el bloqueo eh, a Cuba. Yo creo que la Asamblea General eh, ha sido muy contundente en, en su opinión eh, sobre eh, la afectación al derecho al desarrollo eh, del pueblo cubano con la puesta en práctica eh, del eh, bloqueo. 17 años que hemos tenido una votación prácticamente unánime eh, pues eh, pidiendo el fin, el fin del bloqueo a Cuba. Hemos visto lastimosamente eh, recientemente una serie eh, de acciones que han profundizado eh, pues, eh, la afectación de medidas y sanciones unilaterales eh, hacia Cuba. Eh, la, la, lo, la, lo lamentable es que eh, medidas unilaterales lo que hacen es afectar a, al pueblo cubano. Y lo hemos visto eh, de, primera, de primera mano. Eh, la activación de la, de la ley Hel Helms-Burton eh, con efectos eh, en la economía cubana, en, la, en el acceso a bienes y servicios que afectan, afectan el, bienestar, eh, eh, el, el, el bienestar y el derecho al desarrollo del pueblo cubano. En ese tema, yo creo que la voz de Naciones Unidas, de su Asamblea General, ha sido clara, fuerte y contundente durante estos eh, 17 años, donde pues, las votaciones han sido eh, abrumadoras. La Carta de Naciones Unidas, eh, no olvidemos, pues, eh, no acompaña eh, en la aplicación de medidas unilaterales que afectan eh, a los pueblos de cualquier país, y en este caso eh, al pueblo cubano. Okay, from my list, I have three more questions uh, to finish. Uh, Mr. Abadi, Oscar, and Stefano. Mr. Abadi, go ahead, please. Thank you, Monica. Mm -hmm. Muchas gracias, Señora <laughs> Presidente, por esta conferencia de prensa. Gracias. <clears throat> In the course of the last nine, ten months, uh, during your mandate, which still continues, you have dealt with numerous and complex issues. Which one proved the most intractable? And what contribution did you personally make to advancing its resolution? Thank you. Well, in terms of, uh, of difficulties, I have to say that one of the difficulties is um, the procedural difficulties in chairing the General Assembly uh, sessions. Uh, you have to be uh, very well briefed, have very good advisors, and, and really go by the book. Uh, we just gave an example, but you have to be very careful in respecting um, the, the, the rules of procedure, but at the same time, uh, the will and expectations of uh, the member states. So a few challenges, several challenges, I would say, on the, procedural uh, on the procedural side of chairing the General Assembly with very concrete examples that perhaps at some point I can share um, uh, with you. And uh, I would say uh, perhaps a second challenge, which is more general, but we can go in details. But I think that we are living, um, uh, I, I would say, like a, a trust deficit in the multilateral system. And uh, what I have uh, put all my energy and effort is, first of all, to reposition the idea that multilateralism is irreplaceable and that the beating heart of the multilateral system is the United Nations. So, uh, you know, my idea of the 75th anniversary of bringing it up here and refreshing the narrative on multilateralism was because of that. I, I think that every challenge is an opportunity. And it is not a secret to all of us that multilateralism is being challenged by some. So we need to prove ourselves. We, we really need to prove that we are capable to deliver, to, to change and touch the lives of millions of people around the world. And, uh, and my other effort has been, um, you know, in a very humble way, because my office is small, you know, our capacity also is limited, you know, limited in time especially, but to communicate better. You know, in every trip, in every exchange, I always meet, uh, I go to universities 
I meet with uh, youth groups, with women's groups. I meet with children. This week I was uh, in uh, at the Queen's Museum uh, in the graduation of uh, hundreds of young um, UN ambassadors coming from uh, very, um, uh, uh, you know, incredible neighborhoods of, of, of New York uh, in the Bronx uh, and in, in, in other areas in some... Uh, um, places in Queens where my community uh, lives uh, and they are learning and learning to love the United Nations. I was uh, with there, I think on Monday, um, uh, with them. So communicate better, bring the UN closer to the people, bring uh, the people closer uh, to the UN. We have seen this year uh, our house inundated with people, young people, women, persons with disabilities. That's our house is for that uh, precisely, and, uh, and and perhaps I have to think more about uh, you know issues of um, you know to write it down and say what have been the most difficult issues. But these are the challenges and uh, the general challenges. But if you ask me in concrete negotiations, we have had uh, and we continue to have you know uh, tough times uh, in in agreeing and, and getting together on some critical issues. Okay, so two questions combined, and then Madam President can answer them. So Oscar and Stefano, thank. Go ahead, Oscar. Yes, thank you, Madam President, for this uh, conference. And my question is, uh, is regarding the immigration in Venezuela, and we were talking uh, before about migration, the situation in the border uh, with Mexico and the United States, and you made remarks in how critical and difficult is migration because it's a really easy target for uh, human trafficking in all these crimes. So the same situation is happening uh, these days uh, for the thousands of, of Venezuelans fleeing the country around the, the region. So recently, uh, the special envoy for the UNHCR was visiting the refugees camps in Colombia, and she says that the situation is a situation that lies for death. Are you agree with this characterization and what do you think about it? And my question regarding is this, what do you think, what do you think can be done on the right to protect all these migrants who are fleeing the country and from Venezuela? Thank you, Madam. Okay, thank you. And then we get to Stefano's question, and then we can, Madam President can uh, answer. Stefano, please. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Stefano Vaccara, La Voce di New York, Radio Radical in Rome. As usual, uh, Mr. Abadi, also Oscar, they always have the question that's similar to mine, so I will try to rephrase it. Well, first of all, about migrants, we had here a conference a few days ago that Oscar was referring. And ask you, because I didn't have from the UN yet a clear answer on how to distinguish migrants from, from refugees, because the, the Venezuelans in, the, in that meeting were called refugees, and so I asked why some of the escaping Eritrea and some African country are called migrants. So I will ask your, quest, uh, your answer on that. And then I uh, uh, rephrase another way the Mr. Abadi question. My question is like this. We had an interview. We talked about the power of the, of the, presidents, uh, of the, general, the president of the General Assembly. And uh, so I ask you, what was the power that you thought you had, and instead you didn't? And what it was the power that you discovered, that you didn't know that you had, that you discovered you had? And then last question this. You're a poet. You're a poet, right? And it was, was asked before, when you started, how your poetry will help you in this job, right? I'm the president of a general assembly. Now I ask you, how this job that you did will help your poetry, okay? And, and finally, <gasps> finally. Really? Yes, finally Four? is this. I believe okay. that in the next few years, you will keep your poetry high. But this will help you, a possible, can, uh, for you, a candidature to become Secretary General of the United Nations. <laughs> I heard, okay. Okay, we have now, oh, instead of two, six questions, you know, oh, Madam terrible, President. Huh? Okay. Four questions only. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, let's concentrate on the migration refugee, on the very specific question that Oscar addressed uh, regarding uh, migration in, in Venezuela, but also uh, the, the uh, uh, Venezuelan migrants in Colombia. I understand that was your question. Uh, it is true that Angelina Jolie, which is um, a goodwill ambassador of, of UNCHR, visited Colombia recently uh, to look at the situation of, uh, uh, of uh, Venezuelans uh, in Colombia. Uh, and I think that issue of migration, I would have exactly the same response. Uh, we have a situation of crisis in Venezuela that is known by everybody, and it is... Uh, quite obvious that uh, people decide to look for for places uh, where they feel safer and they feel they have you know a, a better future that's the uh, the uh, the common denominator of of, of migration and uh, the only way uh, to tackle uh, you know the flux of people from Venezuela is to address the political crisis in Venezuela and we are seeing uh, some interesting developments uh, there, some unlocking of the uh, of the um, lack of movement. Uh, one uh, very uh, promising issue is uh, the start of uh, uh, the dialogue process in in Oslo in Norway, uh, that is starting not without difficulty, but there is a conversation going on. And I think this to be uh, needs to be acknowledged uh, and praised. There are other countries that are also uh, moving and doing uh, sometimes a quiet job, but very important job, which is the contact group uh, between the European Union and some Latin American countries uh, as well. So there is movement to address the political uh, crisis in uh, in uh, in Venezuela. And I think the, the last visit of the High Commissioner on Human Rights also uh, was a, a very important development uh, because we see, uh, you know, clearly that there is a roadmap, and there is a, a, a technical team of the High Commissioner's Office that is going to uh, remain in, in, in Venezuela and, and really uh, look at the, the, the human rights side of, of, the, uh, of the Venezuelan uh, situation. There is no magic bullet, but the only thing that we can say is something that the Secretary General and myself have been, uh, we have been saying this, you know, throughout uh, the process. The only outlet uh, for Venezuela is uh, a true negotiation with all parties involved, and we see that they are a um, little bit of, uh, como se dice, rayos de luz, that are starting to appear. Rays of light that are, that are starting uh, to appear. <laughs> you know, the symptom of the crisis is people just moving. And it's not only in Colombia. It's in many countries of Latin America and other countries around the world again. And here I take your question, what is the difference between a migrant and a refugee? This is very clear because there are even international law frameworks that are different. Migrants is a generic of people on the move. They go from one place to the other for different reasons. No, a refugee is a person with an international protection status because a, with a specific request to the country of destination. So there is a legal process that undergoes, uh, you know, until a person uh, is acknowledged and receive the status of a refugee. A refugee is a person that flees from, uh, escapes uh, from a threat. Uh, a threat, whether it be a conflict, hunger, uh, persecution. Uh, persecution politically. And a migrant can come from different uh, regions. I mean, we can have students that are migrants that are come from different countries, and they find that it's better to study here and there. And and there is a flux. You know. I'm sorry, madam. Maybe was my question was not formulated well. What I'm asking, I know the difference. The point. My question here is why the UN calls in this moment the Venezuelan, the, a lot of Venezuelan refugees and they escape in an economic situation, it's terrible, I will escape too. But they call, they're called by the UN refugees. And P 
people escaping from countries in Africa, let's say Eritrea, just uh, because it's a country that I'm, I see a lot of Eritrea and mm -hmm. trying to escape, and they are called, when they're trying to get whatever they're trying, they're called migrants by the UN. That's what I ask. What's the difference, technically speaking? Well, I, I can tell you, I mean, I come uh, from a country that is, um, it's not that the UN calls uh, certain people in a way or another. I mean, that the, there there is a legal implication of that. And uh, um, I can tell you about the, per, the, the very concrete story uh, uh, situation of Ecuador. We are a country of origin, we are a country of transit, and a country of destination. We, in both categories, we do have... Uh, a very uh, important Ecuadorian uh, population living outside the country because of a, s a series of financial crises in Ecuador. So they are here in, in New York, a lot of them, of, of my brothers and sisters. Uh, we are in Spain, in Italy. So, uh, you know, we have migrated. We do have, for example, the population number one in Ecuador, foreign population number one, is Colombia because we, we have received Colombians uh, for f more than 40 years of conflict in Colombia. And there we have two categories. We have the Colombians. The Colombians, they come, they work, they leave, they have families, whatever. And you do have the, ref the Colombian refugees. And we still are the country number one uh, with Colombian refugees, uh, of refugees in general, of the, of the Western Hemisphere. And they, because they request to be protected under the umbrella of the, 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 the refugee institution, international institution. So we, we do have more than 200 requests for refuge from Colombians in Ecuador, much more than Venezuelans. And we do have a, a very important population of Venezuelans that are migrants that are not requesting to be protected until uh, 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 you know, under the umbrella of the Refugee Insti International Protection Institution. So I'm not, I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but it's not that the UN calls one's refugees and the other's migrants. No, uh, I mean, this is it's very concrete, you, very you specific. Been, you've been very okay. clear. I just say the UN is not clear. The UN has institution to an, when okay. it looks to me that uh, <sighs> African, the request refugee status are not treated the same way lately as well as in other parts of the world that they ask, that they ask refugee status. Thank you, Stefan. We're going to have to wrap up, uh, yeah. if you don't mind, because of uh, Stefan Dujah, he could be here soon. Madam President, okay. go ahead. The power of a PGA, I think that um, we are making sure that uh, the office of the president has the, uh, the power, the stature uh, that it deserves, um, because the General Assembly is the most... Uh, representative and democratic body of the organization. We're doing work on that. This has been very clear uh, since, you know, in, in the charter itself, but in many uh, further documents that were adopted by the General Assembly. So in, in the formality, I, I think that um, the office of the president has increased in traction, in decision-making power, in political weight, uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, you wish. And the truth is that, yes, you do have the capacity to improve the work of this organization in many ways. And I have tried my best uh, to, to really walk the talk and make sure that uh, we comply with our um, theme for this year, which is uh, to make the UN relevant to all. And that has been, you know, my major... Uh, m my major efforts uh, geared towards that. And uh, yes, indeed, no doubt, uh, my experience uh, this year and the time that is left is going to be really uh, very powerful uh, food and raw material for my poetry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madam President, for your time. And also each and every one of you for your time as well. Uh, we're going to make a a small break until the 9th of July on the live briefings, but you know, you're gonna have our written briefings every day from uh, our office, the PJ's office. Madam President, anything else you'd like to add? No, just thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, turning your heads and eyes and hearts uh, to the work of the General Assembly. I know that mo some of you are passionate about Security Council, 
but um, and I see you running, you know, when something is happening in the Security Council. But I'm also pleased that uh, you're 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 watching us. Uh, you're looking at the work of the General Assembly. You're getting more and more interested uh, in the work of the Office of the President, and that is extremely encouraging. So thank you for your interest and your attention. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.